a merrier Christmas bulb, my good fellow, than I have given you for many a year. Dickens refers to food and drink over 5,000 times. Dickens looked around him, I think, and looked at the extreme contrast that you see in Victorian London at the time. Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. None of the others have the fire of A Christmas Carol, and I think it's because A Christmas Carol was written with such an intention. It was written to change the world. I think one of the things um, you've got to remember at this point is he's very conscious of who his audience are. I think there's probably the sense that uh, Turkey was a sort of a sort of goose on steroids. <laughs> you know, it was the sort of the next best thing up. I think the interesting thing about Dickens was he is a full-on performer. Make up the fires and buy another coal scuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. Welcome back to Inimitable, the podcast brought to you by the Charles Dickens Museum in London. A Christmas Carol is certainly one of the most well-known stories, probably in the world, certainly in the English-speaking world. And one of the reasons we love it is because it captures this wonderful sense of Christmas and the joy of celebrating the season. What isn't often realised, though, is that at its heart, A Christmas Carol is much more than just a sugary story about Christmas. In essence, this is a story which calls on us to change. Scrooge undergoes this supernatural conversion. He becomes a better man. And in a way, Dickens is asking all of us to do exactly the same thing. So for this episode, the question I began with was, why was Dickens calling on people to change? What was it about the world in which he lived which made him so determined to change hearts and minds? To begin this journey, I sat down with Dr Lee Jackson. Lee is the author of a book called Dirty Old London, and he's an expert in the conditions of London, especially of the London poor. And I do warn you, we do get graphic in this conversation. Lee, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, one of the first things I want to talk to you about is obviously A Christmas Carol. It's Dickens' most famous story. I think probably everybody knows it. But it was written in 1843, a time that's been called the Hungry Forties. What does the world look like when Dickens is writing this story? The 1840s, I think, is, is a very sort of desperate time uh, for many people living in London in this period, so for the poor, which, you know, could encompass people who haven't got a job, can encompass the working poor, can encompass quite a large range of people. Um, it was a period of increasing uh, food scarcity, prices were going up, uh, wages were being depressed, and, you know, it was common to see people without work begging on the streets. It was quite um, a bad time in the sort of, in the 19th century, uh, to not have money. And Dickens looked around him, I think, and looked at the extreme contrast he could see in Victorian London at the time. I mean, there's a great passage in Nicholas Nickleby where he writes about the coach coming into London down Piccadilly with all these amazing ornamented windows with the plate glass and the glowing gas lights and the, and the goods from all over the world on display. And then he talks about that, but then he moves, just shifts slightly into describing the people outside and the faces of the poor looking through that glass, which he says, you know, could be like a, a prison wall to them. They're never going to get through that and have those things. So he's all, he looks around him in London and he sees these stark contrasts uh, between rich and poor, between the conditions people are living in from, you know, the grand mansions in Mayfair to people barely scratching a living uh, on the streets. And he, he brings that to his fiction. You mentioned Piccadilly and... Um... I think that's really interesting to mention because I've been looking through your book, uh, Dirty <laughs> London, and, you know, we think of Piccadilly today as kind of the grand part of London. It's a lovely, beautiful kind of shopping centre, as it was in Dickens' time. But in your book, you mention a Lady Harberton who went walking down Piccadilly and she picked up two cigar ends, nine cigarette ends, a portion of pork pie, four toothpicks, two hairpins, one stem of a clay pipe, 
three fragments of an orange peel, one slice of a cat's meat, half a sole of a boot, one plug of chewed tobacco, straw, mud, scraps of paper, and miscellaneous street refuse. I mean, that sounds <laughs> filthy, and that's a posh part of London. Yes, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, she was, in fairness, I think, a dress reformer, so that was written with intense reminding people what their dresses were dragging through when they walked uh, through the streets of London. And I, thought, I actually thought you were going to mention another, another passage in my, in my uh, book about Dirty in London, where... Um, it's actually about the sheer amount of horse dung that was on the streets and also uh, horse urine and how it was discolouring the ornate bronze facades on the, <laughs> on the shop windows <laughs> by the sheer sort of ammoniacal stench of it. So the streets um, in Victoria were certainly um, very filthy and, you know, Joe, Joe the Crossing Sweeper in, uh, in Bleak House, you know, is, is basically crafting a path uh, through those muddy thoroughfares for the people who can, you know, tip him a coin or two. And he was very much needed, you know, to go out in the streets was an endeavour. You needed uh, stout boots or some women wore uh, sort of overshoes, sort of rubber, rubber sole overshoes to put on their, you know, or ideally, if you're wealthy enough, you did not step, set foot on the streets hardly at all. You know, you stepped out of your house and straight into your carriage and you were off. So, yeah, that's the period we're looking at, a period where, um, you know, there's a big contrast between rich and poor, but also the city itself is not necessarily being managed uh, very well for the benefit of everyone. There isn't yet, at least, what the Victorians would come to call uh, sort of the ideals of, of municipal socialism, I, the idea that you manage the city and create facilities for everyone, you know, for the common people and for the wealthy. That doesn't really exist yet in the 1830s and 1840s, and that just increases that, that polarity that we talked about. Was there anything which helped people? I mean, if you're one of the poor living in these incredible, um, awful slums in London, was there any sort of help available? I'd say when the poor were struggling with lack of employment or sickness or so on, they depended on two possible things, really. One was charity. So it's worth remembering that in this period, all the hospitals that existed were basically charitable institutions. You know, the, who they would let in or not, very little actually. In some of them, you would actually need a sort of a recommendation from someone attached to the hospital. Uh, in others, you would just literally find, you know, doctors who would just send you there sort of straight away. It varied, but there was no universal hospital provision at all. So your reliance on charity and what, what the hospital is willing to do for you. And of course, you know, there was the, the poor law, the, the system for basically benefits. Uh, so some of that was what was called outdoor relief, where you might get some money or some old clothes um, to help you along. But of course, what was also involved in the poor law was the workhouse. In 1834, the workhouses are reformed to become to become larger sort of prison-like bodies, what were called union workhouses. And that's something Dickens, of course, writes about a bit in Oliver Twist. That's slightly what he's having a, a sort of pop at in Oliver Twist. And these union workhouses were designed to be basically kind of punitive. You know, families were separated. Uh, the food you would get would be the absolute bare minimum and you're expected to work while you're there and so on. So it was basically a sort of almost a prison system for, you know, social care. You, you, you could go into the workhouse, but it wasn't necessarily a very pleasant experience. And th that wasn't always the case. Earlier in the century, local parish workhouses, sort of small Small places could be relative, I wouldn't say cosy, but, you know, relatively OK. But then in, the, in 1834, you get this new prison-like system coming in. So, yeah, there's, there's no guarantee of absolutely anything apart from the sort of the parish workhouse. And there were, of course, famously some amongst the poor who wouldn't go in, who literally wouldn't go in. They were too terrified. They found it too demeaning. They found it too like a prison. And, you know, a few were willing to starve on that principle. And, of course, Dickens writes about that. These workhouses, I mean, are so fixed in our imagination of the Victorian time. Do we know much about the sort of society attitudes at the time? So, yeah, I think the to go into the workhouse was very much a source of shame for people and not just a source of shame that was necessarily imposed from above by the sort of upper and middle classes on the poor. I think there were many on in the poor who, you know, had, had jobs of, of one kind or another, were struggling to make ends meet. But would see would see it as you know as a source of shame, a source of regret to have to rely on the state. There was a, there was a spirit of independence, but of course equally the authorities were very much worried about the opposite that they're creating a dependency culture, and so with the Poor Law Act of eighteen thirty four, it is about trying to 
sort of change the benefit system as it were into sort of the bare minimum. So you'd have to be absolutely desperate before you entered the workhouse. And of course, that's quite a cruel idea. And Dickens was very much against that. And that's why we see the descriptions of the workhouse in Oliver Twist and the contrast between the conditions of the poor themselves and then the workhouse governors having their massive feasts. <laughs> um, which, you know. So we're coming back in a way, again, to the idea of contrasts and what the Victorians would have called cant, hypocrisy, um, the hypocrisy of the wealthy. Um, Dickens focuses a lot on that. He perhaps doesn't have any kind of very explicit party politics, but he, he definitely has a politics of sort of human sympathy and calling out people who are hypocritical. And I mean, I've always um, been struck by the fact that Dickens, as you say, sympathised with the working classes in a way that even a lot of kind of well-meaning liberals at the time didn't, because they tended to come from, from quite affluent backgrounds. And one thing that I was really struck of, um, again, in your book, is a discussion about this kind of feeling amongst the poor that even as the laws are changing, there's kind of an interference on their lives, which they're not particularly happy about. What was changing in the Victorian era? And what did kind of working people think of these new changes? I think the, the key thing, actually, you mentioned the year 1832 there. Um, 1830 was an absolutely crucial year because it's the year um, that cholera uh, first comes to the United Kingdom and it promotes uh, a massive sort of national panic and how are we going to deal with this? Not dissimilar to the, to the COVID epidemic, frankly, you know, because it, it's predicted it's going to sweep the nation, it's going to kill thousands. And so what do we do? And what happens is, essentially... Um, we get investigation into the slums because it's known. One thing that's known about cholera, it's not quite clear how you catch it. Uh, there's theories it might be caught through the air, but other people say it might be from touch. No one really knows. But it's known that cholera can be found in the slums. And so it's in 1832 that sort of middle class society uh, first begins to investigate the conditions in the slums. Uh, to see the state of things in which people are living and perhaps to ameliorate it slightly. Now, this only happens during the epidemic. Once the epidemic's over, everyone says, right, leave the slums to themselves. We don't, we don't want to go back to them. But it starts something. And then you get at the end of the 1830s, um, Edwin Chadwick, who is a civil servant in charge of uh, the new sort of big punitive workhouse system that's been installed, saying, well, actually, we're, we're spending a lot of money on sick people within the workhouse system. And think back to cholera and how we started to investigate that. Shouldn't we know a bit more about sanitary conditions amongst the poor? And if we can fix that, perhaps so many people won't end up in the workhouse. Now, it's a very practical calculation. It's not full of human sympathy. It's just about getting less poor people in the workhouse. But again, that kicks off an interest in sanitation, living conditions, how the poor are living. And Dickens' writing ties into that. But he says, yes, it's not about statistics. It's not about... Um, the amount of money we're spending on the poor, you also have to have basic human sympathy for them. Um, and so Dickens is part of this great sort of raising of consciousness about the lives of the poor in the sort of early to mid-Victorian period. How did the poor feel about that? Um, yes, there were, there were certainly some who rejected uh, the middle classes poking their noses <laughs> into their poor homes. And there, there are so many cases of um, you know, well-meaning Victorian uh, domestic visitors, um, you know, going into, into cellars and into basements, just unannounced, they would appear at someone's house, barge in, ask them questions about their life, how much they're earning, how long they live there. And at the end of it, if they thought them, you know, a suitable candidate might give them a meal ticket or, you know, <laughs> give them... So it was, uh, we would see it now, I think, as quite patronising, the sort of that investment in looking into the lives of the poor and sort of charitable work with the poor. I'm not sure Dickens would have seen it exactly that way, or he certainly does mock sort of some of that, um, again, sort of hypocritical sort of canting um, attitude to charity. And as the century progresses, though, you know, that's the trend uh, things are moving towards. And you start getting people like medical officers of health who are employed by local authorities. To, to, that is their job to investigate how the poor are living. And you start seeing, you know, arguably, you know, that's the very beginnings of the NHS, you know, very distant beginnings <laughs> in the 1850s. Tell us a little something about um, if someone was living in the slums. What, what would that have been like? So slum conditions in, say, 1830s London, I mean, typically we're talking about houses that would have originally often been built for the middle classes, but maybe 100, 150 years previously, houses that have 
you know, decayed essentially, and then been sublet uh, to a handful of families, and often sublet and sublet again. It's this endless sort of letting of property uh, to smaller and smaller landlords trying to extract more and more from the tenants. And so you get houses that, you know, were designed, say, for a large family to live in that have 40, 50, 60 people in them. You know, I mean, think of sort of the sort of terrorist Georgian houses that you see, the quite nice ones you see now, which, you know, might be a family home or several flats. But in central London in sort of the 1830s, they were often quite decayed, run down, neglected, and just people packed. So you'd have whole families living in one room apiece and multiple families in them. And they were often uh, very filthy. Uh, we've talked about how filthy the streets were in terms of the horse dung and the general mess. There was often not any kind of working sanitation. Uh, there was, you know, certainly in the 1830s, uh, slum property wouldn't have had any kind of realistic sort of toilet, certainly not a flushing toilet, and often the sort of cesspool type arrangements that were there were often just full. Um, you know, so you're living in something that's smelly, something that's dirty, and you see that, of course, in a lot of the diseases of the time. You know, cholera, we, we talked about earlier, coming in 1832, new to the UK, but things like typhus, typhoid, dysentery, diarrhoea, these were all common diseases of the poor living in central London at the time. And actually, you know, you could argue this goes on even to the end of the century. I mean, Soho, which now seems such a gentrified district to us, um, in the 1890s, uh, infant mortality there was something like one in six. So within the first year of life, one in six children born in Soho, uh, even at the end of the 19th century, were dying. So can you imagine what the conditions were like in the 1830s? So yeah, you didn't want to be living in a Victorian slum uh, if you could at all avoid it. And of course, Dickens, however, was fascinated by these places because they presented such uh, a spectacle of human life. Um, and, you know, he writes about seven dials. He writes about uh, life on the streets, about fights in the streets, um, about, you know, the, these horrible dens that people were living in. The, and also places like the, uh, the overcrowded graveyard in Bleak House, which is sort of in the middle of a slum where people are living literally on top of recently buried remains, their windows next door. You know, so all this is in Dickens, and he, he gives us the spectacle of it, but he also, I think, tries to uh, point to the moral here and, you know, say this needs to be improved. I think there is actually one figure I, I must say, again, taking the stolen from your book, I hope you don't mind me sort of quoting it at you, but uh, that there was 12 properties in St Giles which contained 277 people in 1841, and by 1848, those same 12 properties had 463 people in them. I mean, that's staggering, isn't it? You mentioned as well, the Times reported that in that same year, 1848, there were 95 properties on just covering an acre of land with 2,850 people on them. I mean, that's mind-blowing. It's an intensely dense population. And often the problem with slums, of course, is also that when... Occasionally, slums were cleared, so it would, the area we're talking about in central London there, just off New Oxford Street, New Oxford Street itself was built in the 1840s as a slum clearance project. It was a nice, smart new street at the end of Oxford Street, which would get rid of some of the worst uh, slums in the area and drive a new thoroughfare through to sort of uh, Holborn and that sort of area. But what happened typically when these projects were brought on is that all the people who had been living in those slum houses, which were demolished, crowded into the nearest slum houses. And so the figures you're talking about there in St. Giles are the effect of being squeezed out by a corner of that district into an even smaller corner of that district. And, you know, people didn't necessarily know um, what was best for them either. You know, um, there's something I found when I researched that, but was someone saying that, uh, you know, toilets are no use because actually what people fear most is the stench that comes up from the drains. And people actually preferred often not to have a work a working plumbing system because actually they weren't really working and the smell they feared the smell literally carried disease they call it miasma uh, the idea that foul gas was the cause of cholera or similar and so you had people literally even destroying toilets when they were put in sometimes because actually the things that were put in were rubbish and the drains around were blocked and everything was foul we know that in the Victorian age in London, the population, I think, between 1800 and 1850 doubles, and I think it doubles again between 1850 and 1900. So clearly huge numbers of people are coming into the city, very often ending up in this sort of living conditions. Was that better than where they'd come from? And, like, why? Why are people coming into the city to live in these awful conditions? Yeah, I mean, I think it's easy... Uh, to be rosy about, say, the countryside, you know, the, being a labourer in 
in the 19th century um, in the Victorian countryside wasn't, you know, just sitting around drinking cider and, uh, <laughs> you know, conditions were bad there. As we've already mentioned that there were famines in the, eight, in the 1840s and, you know, that meant declining work, declining wages and so on. So it's the age old story. People want money and opportunity. There's also, of course, family connections. You know, someone knows someone who's moved to London and, and it's exactly what we see t- today, except internationally, you know, people come into this country and then London through their sort of net, informal networks. And, you know, there is, there is possibility there. There is work there if you can find it, if you're not there in a downturn. Uh, you know, you think you talk about the rate London expanded, all, all that expansion um, into the surrounding countryside, you know, sort of in, in, say, the 1820s, 1830s, when Dickens uh, was young, London was essentially what is zone one of the tube map now, you know, his, his sort of family home in Camden when he was a child was right on the fields. It was right on the edge uh, near Camden Town Tube Station. That was right at the edge of London. And then that just mushrooms uh, throughout the 19th century to become not too dissimilar from you know, sort of some of the great London we know now. And to create that, to actually create that new London, these vast suburbs coming up everywhere, uh, was a big employer. You know, you, need, you needed labourers, you needed brick makers, you needed people driving the carts back and forth, you needed the various trades and so on. So there was opportunity in London, uh, but it's balancing the opportunity with, with living conditions and, and, you know, the state of labour at the time. You know, a lot of labour at the time was quite casual. You know, and, and famously, the, the docks were a big employer, of course. We forget that now. The docks were this vast site of employment in London. But equally, a lot of it was casual labour where you've got thousands of men just waiting outside the dock gates in the morning to be picked by the foreman. And if you didn't get picked, you didn't, you didn't earn any money that day. And, you know, again, there'd be fights, you know, there'd be people, you know. So it was a massive, you know, Darwinian sort of competition happening as well. So, yeah, it was, it was very hard, but there, but there was opportunity in London, I think, that wasn't available to many in the countryside. And, of course, there were lots of hard jobs in the countryside as well. It wasn't an easy life there. And I suppose then, was there also, I think we often think, partly because of Dickens, I mean, Dickens himself went into slums and factories and wrote down what he saw and always presented it very bleakly. But... Was there also fun to be had? I mean, you know, how do you enjoy yourself if you're growing up? How, do, how do you enjoy yourself if you're uh, poor in Victorian London? Well, I think if you're, you know, if if you're dirt poor, if you do not have any money coming in, it's it's quite hard to enjoy yourself at all. And that, and that I'm afraid, goes, you know, today is probably the same, right? <laughs> um, but if you have some kind of job, if you have a few pennies, uh, obviously the pub is very much the centre of, of uh, entertainment and working life in poor districts. There were many, many pubs in, in the centre of London. I mean, if you look at where, you know, think about how many sort of closed pubs you can spot today, there were, there were many, many more. I mean, Oxford Street now has, I think, one pub on it. It used to have dozens, you know. Um, so the pubs are the centre of life, and that was, there was obviously drinking and what have you. You actually get dancing in rooms of pubs. Um, you know, any pub that had, like, a room upstairs would once in a while convert it into sort of a temporary dance hall, and all you needed was, like, a fiddler or, you know... A, a, two or three instruments, and people would dance, you know, late into the night. And, of course, in the 1840s, you see sort of pub entertainment morphing into the sort of beginnings of music halls. So those, those same rooms, which might be used for dancing, uh, were also used for sort of singing clubs, were also used for sort of comedian might pop in and, you know, tell a few jokes. And this was the sort of uh, beginnings of music hall in the 1840s. So you've got music, dance, comedy, all building around the pub, actually. And, of course, the Victorians had some concerns about that because was this rational recreation? Was this good for the working poor to be debauching the cells at the pub? So you also see the start of uh, things like parks as, as a sort of public good. So, you know, Victoria Park, famously built in the 1840s, uh, to be a place where, you know, the poor could, the working poor could disport themselves on a Sunday without, you know, inebriation. But, of course, pubs just opened on the very outskirts of the park as well. <laughs> Lovely. I love that. It's like the British always have to have a drink. We need a drink. We do <laughs> exactly. need a drink. I began this podcast talking about the fact that Scrooge undergoes the transformation and in the same way Dickens wanted his readers to undergo a similar conversion. And I think when you start to uncover what London looked like during Dickens's lifetime, and not just London, of course, but urban centres right across the country, you really understand why Dickens became so passionately determined to change people's minds.
You see, the problem wasn't just that this sort of suffering existed, that these slums, these awful conditions could be found everywhere in London in 1843. The problem was that everybody knew they existed and didn't care or did nothing. Underpinning the whole attitude of Victorian society towards the poor was the Church of England. The Victorian society was much more religious than we tend to be today, and they had a very strong sense of morality, and that influenced how they perceived the poor and how they address the needs of the poor. And Dickens was quite unusual in that he was a bit of a rebel. I wanted to find out more about Dickens's attitude to both the Church of England, to religion more widely, and how that shaped his own writing when it came to A Christmas Carol in particular. To tell us more, I sat down with Dr Cindy Chagru, director of the Charles Dickens Museum. Dickens himself has quite a I guess you could say a curious relationship with religion, doesn't he? He's not your conventional Victorian Christian, is he? No, he was raised in the Anglican faith insofar as he was raised in a faith at all. His parents were Anglican, Church of England. They were married in, in a church. Um, Dickens and his wife Catherine were also married in, in an Anglican church. And they baptised their children and they would observe certain holidays. But he wasn't a regular churchgoer. And I think this is important around Dickens because he he railed against an establishment like the church, like religion, as he railed against political structures and legal structures, because these are hugely, they were then, they are now, powerful institutions. There's money, there's power, and they have the capacity and the means to make meaningful social change. And yet, in Dickens' day, he saw that they weren't doing it. So those, you know, and as, you know, during the 1830s, 40s and beyond, that whole century was incredibly dynamic. There was massive change, change from, you know, people living largely in the countryside and and living on and off the land to moving into big industrial centres. And Dickens saw this change dramatically before his eyes. And he saw the structures of, politics, law, religion, doing very little or nothing at all to make a difference. He wasn't shy about making his opinions very clearly known. I mean, I suppose A Christmas Carol has got the more, that's the more poetic metaphor, but there are some of his earlier texts. He was quite open in attacking members of the church, wasn't he? I think... Yes, in fact, there's one which um, was interesting. So 1837 was a year he moved into Doughty Street, um, into what's now part of the museum. And um, at that time, there was a bill going through Parliament called the Sunday Observance Bill. Um, and this was being put forward to restrict, dramatically restrict, what people could do on a Sunday. And Dickens wrote a political pamphlet, an article, um, called Sunday Under Three Heads, in which he argued that, you know, there was a middle ground between... Um, reckless revelry and strict puritanical observance of the day of the Lord, Sunday. Um, And this bill was going to remove everything um, that could be considered enjoyment or joy. Um, And he thought, well, most working people were working six days in a week. Sunday was the only chance for them to do something other than go to church and sit at home in quiet contemplation of the Bible. And he thought, this is madness. Let them go out. But it was going to restrict everything from, you know, you couldn't go to an inn, a pub to get food or drink unless you were traveling. Um, you weren't even allowed to travel unless it was a doctor attending the sick. So this this bill was conceived as, you know, reducing access to um, going to fairs, public debates, getting together with your friends in any way that could be seen publicly. Um, so, so Dickens was, you know, he thought, this is... This is going to remove any possibility of enjoyment or joy from these people's lives. So it was a terrific pamphlet that he wrote. And this was him as a young um, journalist, reporter, and moving into writing a fiction. And already that social reform, that that sort of making your voice heard um, in the context of this great you know, institution of parliament. Wonderful. And I really love to think that he's someone who isn't just saying 
the poor deserve, you know, charity. He's saying, actually, the poor deserve a good time. I mean, mm. that's quite unusual mm. for, the, for the time, isn't it? Yeah. On its second reading, it was narrowly passed by Parliament. And this is, you know, sort of hugely commented on in the more liberal press of the day. Um, but before it could pass into law, um, Parliament was dissolved on the death of William IV, just a few, you know, just a, a week or a couple of weeks after the fact. So, yeah, June 1837, his death put uh, paid to that bill, never made it into law, wow. and never came back. Well, came back, but never got the traction it had wow. before. That's an incredible It was a close run thing. Yeah, so literally the king hadn't died. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's Long really live incredible. the king or Absolutely. not. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If anything, I think this whole episode shows you just how important people in power are. Not just important to their own egos or sense of self, but important in that they do have a very real way of affecting the lives of ordinary people. To Dickens, he was himself a religious person. He famously wrote, the Life of Our Lord, a book on Jesus Christ for his children to reflect on their faith. But what he didn't like was the way in which powerful people within the church could use that influence to, as he saw it, make life worse for working people. It was the hypocrisy which truly angered him. But I think what I'd like to know more about is if Dickens was good at identifying the problems in society. He was good at saying, right, here's the poverty, we need to focus on it. He was good at saying, you lot over there, you should be responsible for dealing with it. But what did he do himself to try and ease the suffering of his fellow citizens? To find out more about his own charitable work, I spoke to Dr Frankie Kubitsky and Emma Harper, curators at the Charles Dickens Museum. Dickens, we often talk about Dickens as being kind of a social campaigner or someone like a charity man trying to raise money for good causes. What were the causes he generally took on? So there are a few different ones. Um, he wanted to support so much, which I think is evident in his work. But as we've mentioned, particularly um, children's education, he, uh, we've got letters where he's sending copies of his work in an early form of uh, Braille to schools for blind children. Um, to give them access to his novels and he says that he's very sorry that he can't come and, and talk and he did give lots of speeches as well in, in support of various um, schools and charities. He also supported Great Ormond Street so he worked with uh, Angela Burdett Coots who was quite a, a rich woman at the time and a friend of Dickens to set up a charity called Urania Cottage which has been referred to as a charity for fallen women. Fascinating. Now I know there's been a lot of you know the, the, the term fallen women I think is used quite a lot mm -hmm. in the Victorian era, but there's a lot of contentiousness over what that actually means, isn't there? Could you tell us a bit about what is meant by a fallen woman? So it's quite interesting. So um, a lot of the contemporary reading of it focuses a lot on sexuality. Um, of course, there were many female sex workers within London and other cities at the time. Um, as people have written, it is the oldest trade. Yeah, <laughs> but absolutely. Um, it was unlikely that actually, um, for moral reasons, that Urania Cottage was full of prostitutes. It was more full of women that had no other support. Of course, they did not have the sort of social security systems that we have today. And if you didn't have a family network who could support you, um, you could suffer terrible, terrible poverty. So essentially, Urania Cottage then is this, this home for for destitute women, mm. so for fallen women as the Victorians were. Mm. I think in a way it's almost tragic that the Victorians seem to lump together sex workers with, with women who've had children out of wedlock with destitute women, and they're all kind of lumped in the same category as immoral, aren't they, and given this umbrella term, fallen woman. It's very cruel. Well, it's very much of the Victorian sort of do-it-yourself ideology, of course, because, you know, there was a, a sentiment in that period that if you were poor, it was sort of your own fault, and yeah. this... The, the poor was split in Victorians' mind to the deserving mm. poor and the undeserving poor. So you'll hear these phrases quite a lot at the time. Deserving poor were ones who worked but didn't have enough money. The undeserving poor supposedly were just lying around, getting drunk and, and not helping themselves. Um, Dickens was very much against that view of the undeserving mm. 
poor and uh, he thought everyone had a right to enjoy a, a tipple, which, <laughs> especially at Christmas time. But no, in, in all seriousness, he, he didn't uh, subscribe to that view um, and he knew some of the barriers in the way of poor people, you know, getting getting better in, in life from his own experience as well, just and looking at his father. Help, absolutely. absolutely. He was very holistic in that sense. He saw this idea of who was around you, who can support you, what mm. education you had, what opportunities mm. you had and what society could provide for you. And he believed that we all yeah. had and, and to do something to support those, especially the young people and children. Definitely. And therefore the sort of charities that he supported that we've mentioned, like Great Ormond Street and... Uh, and the schools really linked into that philosophy. But I think his whole approach just sort of echoes what we say today is, all, you know, you might only be 10 steps away from homelessness. Mm. And, and yeah, they can see yeah. that as well. Yeah. yeah, so that's a very modern perception in, yeah. in many ways that he, he has on that issue. With Urania Cautious then, so it's, it's quite progressive in many ways to set up this charity um, for fallen women, as they were destitute women. What, what happened in that charity? What was he doing? To help them so it's um it's an interesting one because i think the idea is radical but actually what they were doing was not oh, so okay. it was teaching them to do all the nice things that nice young ladies should do and teaching them skills for employment um so uh things like cleanliness um timeliness um needlework Needle all work. Of those things so it's mainly preparing these young women um to be able to go into different um, forms of employment to be able to look after themselves. To manage their own lives, effectively. Mm. We've got some interesting letters um, where Dickens is talking about uniform and um, what the, these women should wear, you know, that there, there's this uh, supply, so hopefully supply of clothing for them as well, but that they shouldn't be made to look like prisoners or outcasts, etc., that they should, uh, they should look at one and feel like a community, but be comfortable and not... He was quite a believer that they should wear cheerful colours. Yes, if I exactly. Remember. Not just brown, you know, mm. ruddy costumes, but that, that would lift them as well, which I think he believes, you know, the power of putting on a, a bright jacket and a, a top yeah. hat, etc., to lift your mood. That's lovely. But I think, you know, you've really given us this image of, I guess, almost the contradictions of Dickens, because you've got some things that are so lovely. I mean, the fact that he's focusing on destitute women at all is a good thing. The fact that he doesn't want to treat them like drudges or like workhouse inmates, you know, he wants to give them a more of a sense of individuality. On the other hand, as you say, this isn't egalitarianism. Yeah. This isn't treating women like equals, is it? This is treating them to be respectable Victorian sort of Ladies. members of society. Mm. Interesting. And what happened to them? So they were trained and given new skills. And then were they expected to sort of, again, work locally or were they you know, sort of encouraged to marry? Or what? what was quite interesting is that they actually, a number of them were sent off to Australia for right. resettlement, this idea of sort of a, a great new world. Yeah. They were encouraged to move abroad to start a new life and, and Angela burdett Coots would have uh, been looking for opportunities to, to make that happen, you know, with the skills that they now had to start afresh. I have to say, this has been one of my favourite episodes to produce, even though the subject has been quite dark. But it just gives you an insight into the world in which Dickens was living and writing. He had this idea for A Christmas Carol, a story which is lovely and glorious and fun and festive. But this idea came to him from this burning passion to heal some of the wounds he could see in the world around him. Now, the next obvious question is, how did he physically go about doing it? A Christmas Carol was more than just a book. To have had such a massive impact on the world, this was a carefully crafted concept in which Dickens intended to shake the world from its foundations, to change hearts and to change minds. In the next episode, we look at physically how this book came to be made. And his first published writing was as early as 1835, so he was only 23 years old. So you've got this case where someone might be reading out the story to a family around the fireplace. Dickens was overdrawn at the bank as a result of this, and he was scared. This is the first time, essentially, that Scrooge has been put to mm -hmm. artwork. Yeah. That's incredible.
Inimitable is produced and presented by me, Jordan Evans Hill. Our contributors are Dr. Cindy Chagru, Dr. Frankie Kubitsky, and Emma Harper, as well as Dr. Lee Jackson, Penn Vogler, Lucinda Hawksley, Miriam Margulies, and Simon Callow. Thanks for listening.